we've found, you know, a subtle but important distinction between saying what your positive need is and what your negative need is. So a negative need means saying what you resent, what you don't like, what you want your partner to stop doing. That doesn't work because your partner will hear it as a criticism, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So instead, flip it on its head and say the opposite. What is it that you do need? How can your partner shine for you? That's what you need exactly. to be telling your partner. That's a positive mm-hmm. need. All right, that little nugget is just a hint of what you're going to get in today's show where we feature doctors John and Julie Gottman here on the Chase Jarvis Live Show. If you have a problem or challenges communicating your big dream, your passion for this one precious life, communicating to your partners, to your spouse, to your friends and peers, this episode is for you. John and Julie, thank you so much for being on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chase. It's a pleasure. Well, uh, as I was sharing before we started, we hit the record button. Uh, I'm a longtime fan. Was it a uh, longtime fan, first time caller? I guess I used to say on the radio. Um, my ambitions around having you all on the show is a to highlight your work, specifically your new work, which is one thing we'll talk about, uh, a new book called The Love Prescription. But I want, I'm a big relationship person. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Kate, for 25 years. We have our, our uh, just had our 25th wedding anniversary. And we have, thank you, thank you. Uh, we've been admirers of your work around relationships for a long time. And it's my belief that uh, you know, that's one of the great things of being a human, being alive is our ability to be in relationship with, with one another and how much that matters. That matters for ourselves, for the communities that we live in, for, for this community, for example. And so um, my hope today is to excavate a little bit uh, more about relationships, sometimes romantic ones, but not only. And so as a little bit of a backdrop for folks who might not be familiar with y'all's work, I'm wondering if if you could just talk very generally about the work that you've been doing for more than 40 years around relationships um, and just add some some color and a little texture for folks who might be new to you and your work. Well, oh, this research began exactly 50 years ago at Indiana University where uh, my colleague Bob Levinson and I started doing research, mostly researching relationships because Bob and I were not having successful relationships with women. So we were wondering if we could learn how to have better relationships. So we built a lab that combined collecting physiological data from two people talking to each other and synchronizing it with the video time code and had couples come to the lab just talking about how their day went, trying to resolve a major conflict in their relationship, and talking about something positive. And uh, later on, uh, Julie and I built this lab at the University of Washington, where we saw 130 newlywed couples in a kind of apartment lab setting, and had them be recorded for 12 hours during the day, and followed them for many years as they became, many became pregnant and had babies and studied them with their babies also. And what we found from all this research was that we could predict with over 90% accuracy the future of a relationship from the information that we were collecting, how they expressed emotion, how they talked about a problem, how they showed interest or lack of interest in one another. And Julie and I really built a therapy based upon those findings, those prediction findings. And we've been training therapists and giving workshops for couples and testing them for the past 26 years. That's kind of a thumbnail story of this. You see the last 50 years of your life. 50 years of research, yeah. A a very important thing to add is that uh, all of the interventions that we incorporated into our books, into our workshops, into the training of clinicians who practice them, were not based on any special wisdom of ours, any 
uh, great guru-dom of ours at all. The people who really taught us the most were the couples. And the ones who succeeded, we looked very carefully at what they were actually doing to succeed versus the ones who really ended up, you know, crashing and burning five or six years later, maybe 10 or 15 years later. Uh, we wanted to avoid that um, and really help couples with, we knew the skills that worked, the ones that worked for those couples who were successful down the road. So, you know, really important to do a, a shout out to all the couples who participated in the research. And we studied over 3,000 couples following some as long as 20 years to see what would happen to their relationships through different phases of their lives together. And that's really what provided uh, the foundation of our work. Wow. Well, there's a lot to uh, dig into. Uh, I want to make sure, um, want to make sure to do the work justice. And so, I think in this to keep the momentum of that that work, that body of work that you've been building, you just mentioned Julie finding a set of I don't know. I'll call them attributes for lack of I don't have a clinical vocabulary, but a set of attributes that uh, you could ascribe to the couples that were successful. And so it seems like that's a, a worthy place to dig in. And I'm hoping that people who are listening or watching or, you know, that they're probably doing a mental calculus about how many of these attributes that they think they have in their relationships or that uh, they maybe they're measuring past ones that were either that were maybe not successful. But if you could start off by just like giving us a, a wide array of some of these attributes and then people can start doing their own mental calculus. We'll, we'll try not to save everybody on this particular show, but we may be, we may help a few. Okay. So um, first of all, it's important to note that these attributes are not individual attributes. They're uh, attributes of the relationship itself. I like to imagine the relationship as a golden sphere, uh, a ball between the two partners, and they are shaping whether that ball, that ball is shining or whether it's covered, you know, with dirt and crud and bad stuff. So let me just start off by saying first, um, the things that successful couples avoid. We call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first one is criticism. And criticism means blaming a, a problem between the two partners on a personality trait of the other partner. So you're so lazy. You're so inconsiderate. You're so thoughtless. Those are all criticisms. You never pick up the kids on time never and always are criticisms. So one has to really watch out for those first. Secondly, contempt. Contempt is like sulfuric acid for the relationship. Uh, it not only destroys the trust, the care, the connection between partners, it also, we found, destroys the immune system of the person who's hearing the contempt. The difference between criticism and contempt is that contempt is spoken from a place of superiority, either moral superiority, intellectual superiority, looking down their nose at their partner with scorn, with a little disgust, uh, name calling as part of that, mockery, sarcasm, all of that is contempt. So one really has to avoid that one big time. The third horseman is defensiveness. And couples typically, when they feel attacked, may feel defensive. But when they express it, that doesn't work well. So couples will either um, be a righteous victim. How can you say that? I always pick up the kids on time, you know, with a little bit of whining in there. No good vintage for whining. And uh, they may also counterattack. Oh, yeah, well, you forgot to pick up the laundry last week. You know, that kind of stuff. 
So that's defensiveness. That doesn't work. Uh, the antidote to that is taking responsibility for oneself, for one's mistakes. And then the last uh, horseman we call stonewalling. And stonewalling is interesting. It's tied in to the physiology of the person stonewalling. What stonewalling means is you completely shut down. You do not give your partner any eye gaze, any um, comments, any head nods, no response whatsoever for long periods of time so that you appear to be a stonewall completely tuning out the person who's speaking. But what we found is that for many people who stonewall, while they're doing it, their heart rates are above 100 beats a minute while they're just sitting there quietly listening to their partner. The problem is that they're in fight or flight. They feel like they're being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger. And so they really retreat and withdraw inside themselves to soothe themselves because sitting there in fight or flight feels awful in your body. So you go inside to just shut down that response. So those are the four that don't work. Now, what does work? First, creating love maps. Love maps means understanding your partner's internal world, their feelings, their needs, their most embarrassing moments in childhood, uh, their best friends, really knowing who they are inside. The way to get there is by asking your partner big questions. Secondly, expressing fondness and admiration, not just thinking it, but expressing it through words, through touch. Third is what we call turning toward. And turning toward means that when your partner makes a bid for connection, you then respond positively to that partner's bid for connection. You can just say, huh, that's interesting. That's all it takes. Just mm -hmm. respond in a positive way. The fourth uh, level of what we call the sound relationship house that we're building here is positive perspective. All that means is that you give your partner the benefit of the doubt. If they're grumbly or grouchy, you think they had a bad night of sleep. You don't think, what a creep that guy is. Very different, right? Then there's managing conflict. And we have special ways uh, of coupled managing conflict in some that in which they describe themselves, their own feelings, their own needs rather than describing the flaws of their partner and, and right. trying to get their partner to be a different person. Yeah. Then there's honoring each other's dreams. Every one of us is a dreamer. We all have wonderful things that we think about doing uh, in our daydreaming and night dreaming too. And knowing what those are in each other and trying to help each other fulfill them. And finally, creating shared meaning. Shared meaning means what are your values? Why are you here? What legacy do you want to leave behind when you pass on? Each person speaking about that to the other so that the other knows you at the deepest level. Those are the factors that really help couples succeed that you can just rattle those off. I guess 50 years of research is indelibly, indelibly marked on your mind. Uh, incredibly helpful. I have two terrifying fears that I have to ask you about right now after hearing all that. Uh, and then I, I want to come back and focus specifically on dreams. So I'm going to put a pin in dreams because this audience is an audience of dreamers. They're people who are bucking the system or they're entrepreneurs. They're creators who have often values and dreams that conflict with the mainstream. And so being seen or seeing others is, is ultimately a huge challenge I've written about. And I want to come back to that. And the reason I want to come back to that is I kind of want to address this, this, <laughs> this fear that I have. So I shared earlier, my wife, and I, uh, we've been married for 25 years. And I think we have an amazing relationship. 
we're each other's best friends. We talk and think about this. And yet we have, I would call it occasional moments where those four horsemen pop up. And so I'm, I'm hoping that it's not a, they never pop up. Thing. But what's the difference between what would you consider you know, a healthy um, manifestation of those occasionally popping up and what is, or, or a, a realistic, maybe that's a better word, a realistic appearance of those things versus a no, never. Because, you know, I, I can think of times where I'm upset and Kate's quiet and staring at me and, and you know, the other way around. Um, and, and yet I feel like we're incredibly healthy relative to most of the other relationship um, examples that we have in our lives. So tell me we're not doomed and, and help, help me understand how, how that may show up, but it's not like an attribute or a character or, or, or maybe I'm, maybe I am, doomed. maybe you can walk me through that, John. Yeah. What a very important part of uh, what we discovered is that repair is the important thing that, mm. you know, it's really hard to maintain great communication over time, just because we have two brains in a relationship instead of one. And mm -hmm. so we tend to be out of sync a lot of times. Uh, even the best relationships, and Julie mentioned this, turning toward bids for connection. The, the masters of relationship turn toward each other's bids an average of 86% of the time. The disasters turn toward them 33% of the time. Mm -hmm. So 86% of the time is really pretty good, you know? Yeah. So, you know, 15%, you know, they're, they're kind of not doing well, you know, but then they repair, you know, they talk about what went wrong they take responsibility for their role in this communication. They process it. And that's a big part of our blueprints for helping couples come to a mutual understanding when there is a disagreement where they can understand each other's points of view. So if you're at 86% of the time, you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start keeping track now. <laughs> Kate's going to say, what are you thinking about? I'm going to be looking up and to the right, you know, accessing that part of my brain that's doing math. I wonder how many of these we've had. <laughs> um, well, thank you for that. That makes me feel better. Um, you're, I need to turn attention to the streaming bit, as you talked about one of the, you know, acknowledging the dreams of others. And Julie, as you said, we're all dreamers. So also what John's mentioning, like, there are two brains at work here and, you know, one Kate, one might be dreaming and the other might be in flight or flight or fear mode because of her finances. And so, you know, understanding that, that, you know, if you put those two together, this ability to see or be seen, you know, obviously that's complicated, but the dreaming specifically aspect, that is, I would say, having, you know, been leading this community for, you know, a decade and a half, when I find people who are not the version of themselves that they want, in part because their, their partner either rejects, and it's often not overt, it's this really sort of undercurrent of, well, gosh, if you leave your job and then we might not be as financially stable, or there's a lot of fear around that. And what I find is, you know, what I coach is trying to communicate your, your biggest dreams. And if your partner, you know, is supportive of that or not supportive of having a communication around what, what is the, what are the fears and realities or not. But I see this as not just a, a problem in the research that you're doing that you've shared, but culturally and certainly it's hyper present in this community because of the, the large part some of the identities of the folks that again they come here for advice and to to be able to pursue their dreams and career hobby and life so help us understand if you can this dreaming part because i just find it to be a sticking point especially for those in our community oh, i love that question chase um, because um, we have seen that successful couples have a special way of dialoguing about their dreams. And we mm. have translated that into an intervention or an exercise. But let me explain what that is. 
First of all, 69% of all problems that couples have are perpetual. They never go away. <laughs> you have them forever. And oftentimes, wow. they're related to lifestyle preferences. They may be related to personality differences. But underneath each person's position is often a dream. Often. So let's take finances like you brought up. And one person really wants to spend, the other person wants to save and save and not spend at all. And underlying that, what's going on? Well, there are dreams involved. So in the intervention, what we ask one partner to do is ask a set of six questions to unearth what is beneath their partner's position on the issue. And those questions include ones like, do you have any underlying beliefs, ethics, or guidelines that are part of your position on this? Is there some childhood history or background that is part of your position on this? And that's a big one of course, as you can imagine. The third one is, why is this so important to you? What makes it so important to you? Another is your feelings about it, of course. And what would be your ideal dream here? What would that really look like? And finally, is there some underlying purpose, mm. some life purpose that's related to your position on this issue? And when people just stop and listen without bringing up their own point of view until the other person is finished answering those questions and then they trade roles, then the first person listens, asks the same questions of the second. What you find is a softening of the space between the two partners because oftentimes there's history, there's baggage, there's maybe even death of a parent who was planning on retiring. And as soon as they retired, they dropped out of a heart attack. So they want to spend now, for example, who can count on the future. The person who wants to save grew up in poverty and wants to avoid an impoverished older age like he saw or she saw their parents experiencing. So compassion is part of what softens that space between the other. And also underlying at the deepest level, how does this tie in to the soul of their partner, to the heart of their partner? How is this a core ent entity for that person fulfilling this dream that they have? Once that understanding is accomplished, then there's room for compromise. And we have a special way of helping couples with that as well. Let's get very tactical for a moment. I'm going to put a theoretical out there it's right now. As someone who's listening or watching, it's like everything you just said, that sounds amazing. Give me some tactics because I need to go have this conversation with my partner. Right. Give me like, how do I open this conversation? Is it, is it like, Hey honey, I'm not being fulfilled because you won't let me pursue my dreams. Obviously that's not the good opening, but so, so maybe by contrast, John, you can give us some, like how to get started with this conversation. I, I bet. And for those listeners out there, this is where you're going to want to like, go get a piece of paper or if you're driving, obviously just keep listening. But like, I, I need to, I need some tactics from you guys. How do we broach this topic of wanting to do something with your life that's different? I know that we were a part of the great resignation. People have, after the pandemic, are completely, you know, relooking at so many aspects of their lives. And I know that career is one. And 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 so help us. Yeah, it's it really involves putting persuasion on the back burner. So you're not trying to persuade your partner of anything. You're not trying to problem solve and come to a compromise. So the first step is really arriving at mutual understanding. And by postponing persuasion and asking those questions that Julie mentioned, those precise questions that are written out, 
and just listening to your partner without interruption, without uh, trying to dissuade your partner from those feelings and beliefs and those ideal dreams. You know, we found that about 87% of couples really were able to make a breakthrough. And that softening of the space between them that Julie mentioned really happens, you know, most of the time, 87% of the time. Sometimes people really do need help. They need a counselor or, you know, some kind of coach to help them get to that place. But 87% of the time, just asking those questions uh, helps them arrive at that place of mutual understanding. Let me mm-hmm. add something here, mm-hmm. John. So, uh, Chase, I imagine you're wondering how do I even bring this up? How do I introduce the topic? Yeah, is this a dinner? Is this a dinner time conversation? Is this a long walk on the beach? Like, help us. Okay, so it can be any setting as long as it's just the two of you. It can be a date night where you're out to dinner. It can be taking a long walk. Uh, works a little bit better, I think, if you're sitting and facing one another. And what you want to say to your partner, first of all, before you ever get to the actual conversation, is something like this. It would be, honey, you know, I've been giving some thought to how I'm moving through time these days, how I'm kind of really living my life and whether or not I'm really living who I am fully which is something that I really value and something I want to do. Would you be willing to have a conversation with me in which I describe what's going on for me inside? And then I listen to your own responses to this, your own thoughts and visions for how we move forward together. That's what I would say. When would be a good time for that? Because you really mm. want time to do this. I mean, give yourself at least a couple of hours to mm. do this. And then when you finally get to the date night or the dinner, you say, are you ready to have that conversation? Does this feel like a good time? Then um, you might right into the Gottman Institute, which we started 26 <laughs> years ago, before the date, and you, you get um, what's called the dream within conflict exercise. You can just write to our Gottman Institute and they can get that for you. It's the list of questions. You pull out that paper and you say, looky here, I have some cool questions. And I would love it if you would read to me each one of these questions and I'll answer each one because it will really draw us out into uh, understanding each other at a deeper level. So could you read Mm. those questions and I'll answer them. And after that, um, I will ask you the same questions so that you too can answer them and have your own points of view uh, understood by me. How does that sound? Mm. So, so what's, what strikes me is, um, is a place where most people stumble and this, I'm just, just again, anecdotally, but is in not really being prepared to have this conversation. There's more, it's almost like a, you sort of blurted out, and then you come off as unprepared and uh, and you don't say what you mean or you haven't given enough thought and you just want to have the conversation. And what what I hear in contrast to that is this is if it's important to you that you're actually going to approach it in a very thoughtful, very intentional way. You're going to have the list of questions. You're going to make the request, you know, when is a good time for us to have this conversation? Because this is how I'm feeling about my relationship with time or my, my dreams in life, that feels very different than just popping the question and, and making sure you're alone and seated together and that you have time. Like all of those, that's, that seems very intentional. Now this could be just me making this stuff up, 
But do you find that is one of the big mistakes that people, you know, they try and have this big conversation on the way to drop the kids off at soccer practice or, you know, and if, if, if that's true, tell me, and what are some other ways that people just botch this, this particular question up? Yeah. You know, I think, um, people often will blurt this stuff out and they'll blurt it out in the middle of a conflict. Why did you spend so much money on that dress? It's ridiculous. You know, you shouldn't be spending that kind of money, blah, blah, blah. And they argue on the surface. They never go deep. They mm -hmm. argue on the surface and it goes nowhere. And then they end up feeling frustrated and angry with no resolution. So sure. You know, that is one thing that happens or what may also happens happen is that perhaps somebody grew up feeling unentitled to their own needs, to their own dreams, to their own fulfillment. Um, nobody listened to them, let's say, as a kid or worse. And so they don't bring it up. They bottle it inside and they're afraid to reveal it for fear that they'll be made fun of or they'll be criticized, or they'll simply be told, no, that's not going to happen. So keeping it inside mm. creates emotional distance between the partners, and you don't want to do that either. Mm. We uh, wrote a book, Chase, um, the book before this new one, called Eight Dates, Essential Conversations for a Lifetime of Love. And that book has the list of these questions as well as a number of other exercises to draw you closer. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. This is the perfect time for me to restate what I mentioned in our opening salvos around uh, things that I promised we would cover. Your most recent book, The Love Prescription, Seven Days to More Intimacy, Connection, and Joy, the seven-day series. So this book the seven day series to me that all of a sudden feels radically more manageable than oh my gosh i got these lifetime of uh, personal trauma and relationship woes and uh so let's use this as a way into the new material so were you finding you know i, I shared also that my wife and i we were you know signed up to do um, one of your programs called the art and science of love, which sadly was put on, put on hold because of the pandemic. Um, but for those people like Kate and I, who are eager, uh, to do work. And I think again, we're, we're good communicators or for people who are not, and they need a way into the material. Talk about why the, why seven days and how this may be different than some of the other work that you've done. Okay. Uh, seven days is really about uh, drawing emotional connection closer with your partner. How can you manifest more love towards your partner in really easy ways, really simple ways that we found through our research make a huge difference? So on each day, we take another aspect of deepening your friendship, deepening your intimacy, and give you a little exercise, a little something to do. Uh, even if your partner doesn't read the book and doesn't want to hear yeah. anything, these are still things that you yourself can do, or ideally what both of you will do mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. draw closer to one another. So, yeah. for example, um, I talked about love maps earlier. And the way to understand your partner better is by asking them questions. So there's a couple of exercises in that chapter that are really fun and interesting at the same time, where you are uh, looking at a little question and trying to answer it in terms of your partner's world. And there's a whole list of those. Give an example. So an example might be, hey, John, uh, let me see. I'm supposed to guess who your best friends are. So I'm guessing your best friends are Bob Levinson, mm -hmm. Neil Jacobson, and maybe Larry. Yeah, that's pretty much right, except for that Neil died. A long time ago. So, oh, really? So Neil and I are not in touch. 
anymore. Huh. Well, you know, are yeah. you sure you're not in touch? I've heard some of those crazy night dreams you have. Anyway, so you're guessing at the right answer for your partner and your partner gently corrects you if you get it wrong. No keeping score. And you learn more about who your partner is here and now. In addition, there's a deepening of love maps by asking big open-ended questions. Those are the ones that may tap into dreams, for example. Give an example of that. So why don't you ask me an open-ended question? So when you think about our lives together, what would you imagine would be the ideal place to be in, say, three years from now? Hmm. Place as in geographical place? Well, that, partly that, but also, you know, what unfulfilled hopes and wishes mm. do you have that mm. you'd like to pursue? You know, I would love to be painting. Ah. I would love to go back to oil painting and painting portraits mm. like I used well, to. Yeah. But also maybe painting landscapes. I think that would be really cool. So and then traveling all over the world into really crazy places that you don't want to go, but I'll drag you anyway <laughs> to go paint the landscapes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. So, yeah. So, um, so those questions help as you exchange your answers back and forth, they really help you update who your partner is. And it doesn't mm. take long. You know, you can do it for 20 minutes or something, half an hour. Um, but who is your partner here and now? We lose track of that. And it's important that we stay in touch with how our partners are changing and evolving over time. So if people can't think of the right questions to, to ask, we have a list of questions we right. can start with. Yeah, th that's part of what I wanted to call people's attention to is your work is is very practical and tactical. It's very accessible. What I've what I've come to know of your work, and by purchasing the books again, the most recent one we're talking about today, uh, the Love Prescription: Seven Days to More Intim Intimacy, Connection, and Joy. Uh, but there are others, and also I would steer people to your website, which is incredible, the Gottman Institute, Gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N.com, where there are all kinds of, uh, you know, surveys and um, just entrances to the work where lists of questions you talked about writing in. Um, it's just, it's wonderfully accessible. So for the folks who are saying, I need this list of questions, start with, start with the books. They are incredible. There's, there's actually an app that people can get for free on the, uh, on the app store. If they just mm -hmm. type in Gottman card decks, they can download this app that has 14 different card decks for just having fun together and deepening your relationship. Uh, there are a hundred questions you can ask to find out your partner's erotic world as well. Um, and that's free. It's been downloaded now 350,000 times. <laughs> and it can reside on your phone. That's beautiful. Beautiful. So I'm going to hijack this last little bit here for a second. Not just on the erotic bit, but on the person's changing and um our mutual friend Brene Brown uh, you guys did a great great show with her she's you know I've been homies for a decade or more now she's just a, one of my favorite people um obviously her research on shame and vulnerability is you know it's just a, it's a, a nice little overlapping Venn diagram with some of the work that you've done and I'm wondering what role would you guys say that 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 plays in this exercise this the you know self-awareness is one thing but the ability to to declare these scary things to your parent or to your partners is that is not without a bunch of vulnerability i'm wondering if you could talk about that for a second mm -hmm. yeah you know i think when people have come from backgrounds where they have been shamed uh, for talking about their internal world. I don't, I'm not interested. I don't want to hear about that. Just 
go perform in school. That's all I care about. Um, or uh, maybe in this relationship too, they've been mm -hmm. emotionally injured uh, by some really bad fights where insults were hurled at each other and they landed and people have never uh, talked through what each person was experiencing during that fight, which is what we call processing in order to get past it so that people still carry that lack of safety, that sense mm -hmm. of lack of safety with the other person. You start light, start light. You know, you start mm -hmm. with the simplest of love map questions and see how that goes. And it's really, really important for each person perhaps to start off by saying, you know, I'm kind of afraid to do this mm -hmm. exercise. Um, I haven't felt, you know, very comfortable with us opening up to each other for a long time. But I really want to try to get closer to you because I'm starting to feel lonely and I want to reconnect with you. So let's start by asking each other just some simple questions like, who are your best friends? Or, um, I don't know, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite tree? Um, what characteristics of your own family do you want your kids to inherit? You know, things like that. That's a big one. That goes mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. bigger. But again, you're staying out of the realm of criticism and mm -hmm. the listener um, who's listening to the answers needs to accept them as totally valid and representative of the person who's speaking. You can't, mm -hmm. as a listener, say to the other person, that's not really what you think. I've seen you do this and that, and that doesn't fit with what you're saying. Don't invalidate Instead, validate your partner by saying something like, wow, that's really interesting. And you can ask a follow-up question too, like, who are your best friends? Well, what is it about Jane that you really like that makes her one of your best friends? Tell me more. Help me understand. Yeah. So... Uh, it's very important for the listener to just take in what the other person is saying. It's becoming clear as you're speaking how important the role of asking questions is in a, in a relationship. And as I'm listening to you, and obviously I'm reasonably familiar with some of your work, I think that can be intimidating for some folks. And that's one of the reasons I'm directing people to the book and back to your website and whatnot, because you don't actually have to memorize these things. You, you, you're listening to, to two people who have got, you know, a century of combined work in this space, just ask these questions off the cuff and don't feel, don't feel like you have to. One of the things that uh, I would uh, also champion as a, as a fan of yours, this most recent book, you know, this, the a roadmap for asking questions there is actually a formula that you talk about for love and connection in this book the love prescription and you know it has to do with you know asking open-ended questions secrets to giving genuine compliments how to avoid you know refrain from criticism and negativity and how to specifically ask for what you need uh even so far as the ground rules for uh date nights which is is fascinating so are, are we are we getting better or are we getting worse at this as a culture if you've seen you've been studying this for so long are we getting better or worse or are we just staying the same well you know there is a there's a lot of uh evidence uh that community is declining in america the classic book that robert Putnam wrote called Bowling Alone, really illustrates that since 1960, people have been drifting apart in the United States and not trusting other people very much and not feeling safe being vulnerable with them. And more polarization has crept in to our relationships with other people where we uh, vilify them. You know, you're a Republican, you're a Democrat. You know, you're evil. <laughs> you know, if you're not like me, you're evil. 
So I think we're, I think it's getting worse. And there's a really a crying need for improving trust between people in this, in this culture of really mm -hmm. having, having respect for differences of opinion and being curious instead of judgmental. And I think we have a long way to go to get back to a sense of community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would really agree with John. Um, I think that there were a lot of uh, subtle ways uh, that people were rejecting each other or judging each other that were underground or more subtle, uh, certainly not so subtle to uh, the recipients of that judgment, that rejection, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but somewhat invisible to other people. And mm -hmm. for the last six, seven years or so, uh, all those subtleties have disappeared and it's now been crashing rejection, crashing judgment, uh, fiery uh, condemnations of particular groups of people. Uh, and minorities have really suffered uh, as a result. Um, even within families, that are, there are terrible divisions uh, based on people's political opinions. People are really having a hard time hearing one another because the speaking is through a megaphone and it's blasting out the ears of the listener. And so it's John and I feel this fervent need to help people learn how to listen. But when listening, they have to be listening to a speaker, you know, somebody speaking to them who is simply describing their own self, their own feelings, their own thoughts, their own beliefs, without criticizing and finger pointing at the other person, mm -hmm. without blame, without contempt. And mm -hmm. people really don't have the language to do that. They don't know how to do it. Yeah. They don't know how to yeah. name their emotions. They don't know how to state their needs. They don't know how to really convey perhaps how deeply hurt they are uh, by something that's being said without finger pointing. Mm -hmm. There are ways of doing that, you know, which is part of what yeah. we teach. Um, and people really need to learn. Is there a relationship between your work and, say, nonviolent communication, which is a practice that Kate and I try to employ? Um, is there a relationship there? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's completely consistent with what we recommend, which is instead of pointing your finger at your partner and turning your partner into an enemy or a stranger, point your finger at yourself and talk about what you feel and what you need about a specific situation. And that makes all the difference. Let me, yeah. let me add to that, that we've found, you know, a subtle but important distinction between saying what your positive need is and what your negative need is. So a negative need means saying what you resent, what you don't like, what you want your partner to stop doing. That doesn't work because your partner will hear it as a criticism, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So instead, flip it on its head and say the opposite. What is it that you do need? How can your partner shine for you? That's what you need exactly. to be telling your partner. That's a positive mm -hmm. need. Hmm. Um, yeah, and I can personal attestation that how powerful that is. and. I don't know why, but maybe it's just because there's a humility and a vulnerability in saying what I'm feeling when I say I am angry, sad, scared. You know, when you say that versus, you know, you spent too much money last month or you, you're you putting our family at risk for, you know, all these things that the you, just the simple I, when you know, my wife is very special and that even early on, I don't know if it was just endemic to her humanness, but she started saying how she felt and I had not, it scrambled my brain. It 
pickled me. It like I was immediately did not know how to respond. When, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, you know, 30 years ago when we first met and we would, you know, one of our early earliest arguments when she's saying, well, I feel and I'm like, I, I, hmm, I have no I have no response to that other than, gosh. I need to, I need to make some adjustments here. It, it, I don't know what it was about that particular, that, that, that what it is about what mechanism is at work there, but it's incredibly effective. Um, and again, the first time I'd being growing up in Seattle and, you know, y'all doing work at the university of Washington, um, you, you were very locally well known for that research that was predicting, you know, the success of relationships. And I remember, you know, my earliest exposure to work was like, Oh, that's that thing. <laughs> you can learn to communicate and not you know do these things and not those things. Gosh. Um, so I want to thank you for that personally. But where I want to take the conversation now is specifically around the last few years. Yeah, you know, on this show and others, and you know, you all probably seeing in your work that there's something different. We've been indelibly marked. Um, it's been, you know, a shock to culture and that shock cuts both ways. I think there's positive aspects and negative aspects. I want to know, is there, is this idea of people suddenly coming to, uh, it, it seemingly suddenly coming to a realization about, whoa, I've been doing this. And then the great pandemic happened and maybe I lost people or I lost connection with myself or others, my relationship. What is it that's making people say, I'm not going to do this anymore. Is this, is this make believe? Is this media conjuring up a story? What are you seeing in the research and should people listen to these instincts or are they, is it a passing fad? Hmm. That's a really great question. You know, um, just a little bit of perspective. I've been working with cancer patients and their families uh, in all kinds of stages, uh, including dying uh, for, uh, gosh, 40 plus years. And here's what I see. When people are facing death or the possibility of death, it sharply changes the arc of people's priorities and people's feelings. Mm -hmm. Most of us are running so fast day by day, moment by moment to get the checklist done and the work done that we don't take the time to reflect. But the pandemic ground us to a halt and compelled us to really look at, my God, maybe my life won't last forever. What should I be doing with my life? Do I still want to work in that factory? Do I still want to pump gas? Do I still want to, you know, face uh, people at the office who are somewhat you know, withdrawn and shy and there's no connection at all. Is that what I want to be doing the rest of my life? And it's making people think, reflect. Um, there may have been echoes inside for years and years saying, why don't you go be an interior designer? Why don't you go back to school? But they weren't listening because they were running too fast. Well, they had to stop running. They had to stay contained in their quarantine. All they could do was look in the mirror, basically. Look in the mirror and see what counted and maybe what was less important. And because of that, I've been hearing people making pretty massive changes, massive changes in this last few years. John, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I really think that Julie captured it. Uh, I think the pandemic, the, the big shutdowns, uh, really made people reflect on what they were doing with their lives. And I think that's still going on. People just aren't 
sure what the future holds for them, you know, and where where we should be going, where they should be going yeah. in their lives. Well, this leads me to a follow-up question, which is, why do we need trauma and big stuff like that to look at our own lives? Why do we need divorces? Why do we need deaths in the family and personal tragedy? What is it about the human condition that makes us so that we need this big stuff to look at our work? And, you know, presumably your your work is the goal of it is in part, at least to help people not need those things or for, to, to take care of the people who do. But right now there might be someone who's like, yeah, I got it pretty good. What can we say to those listeners and watchers to, I don't know, you want to get ahead of this work. You want to strengthen your relationship before it needs to do the work. You want to, what, what, what advice would you, would you give to people who, you know, they're, they're still with us. They're, you know, we're 50 minutes in 45 minutes in and yet they're like, yeah, I got it pretty good. I know what I want to do with my life. I communicate pretty well, but how do we, you know, what do you say to folks who are either unwilling, maybe a little trepidatious or you know, what, what, what advice do you give to them about doing this kind of work? Well, first of all, um, I'm hearing two questions. One is why do people not uh, put more priority on reflection? And then how can we help people do so? Mm -hmm. um, change is scary. Change is scary. We'd rather coast along as we're doing than jump ship, go swimming in the ocean. We don't know where the next piece of land is. We have no idea of where we're going to end up. Will we be in the tropics? Will we be in the Arctic Circle? We don't know. And so it's scary to change. And yet... You know, I come back to the magnificent research that John has done, primarily. We know from this research that if these kinds of changes, for example, that we've outlined in our book, um, The Love Prescription, if people make those changes and they keep doing those changes, their relationship will change too. And it will typically change for the better because we know that these methods are what helps couples be successful. So it's trusting in the science. It's trusting in the research. And having seen that these methods work in study after study, then, you know, Sometimes we just have to step off the dock and dive in. And the water may not be so cold, even in the Northwest. The water may be warmer than you think. There's a, there was a great study done uh, at UCLA by the Sloan Center in which they put cameras and microphones in, in the homes of 30 dual career couples. And they discovered, you know, these couples in Los Angeles, uh, each of them have a career and they have young kids that in general, their lives had devolved to this long to-do list. They talked to each other only 35 minutes a week. And most of their conversation was about who's going to do what when. It wasn't about what are your dreams. <laughs> And, you know, they, they even spent in an average evening, they spent less than 10% of their time in the same room with their partner, let alone talking to their partner about these open-ended questions. So mm -hmm. the danger is that you're really kind of on the treadmill doing stuff to make your life function. And you don't take the time, even on a weekend, uh, to say, eh, how are you feeling about our lives. You know, what would you change if you could? How do you feel about mm -hmm. this home of ours? What would you change if you could, if you could, and why? You know, so they don't stop and reflect. That, that study kind of, you know, really surprised me at how little people even talk to each other uh, about anything other than who's going to do what when. <laughs> Man, for the, yeah, for those who were not watching the video there, you're listening. My eyes just about popped out of my head when you said 35 minutes. I thought it was going to be a day. And then you said a week. Right. 
that that feels that just sounds catastrophic. Like thirty five minutes. Most people spend thirty five minutes a day scrolling Instagram. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. At least. God. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, uh, I have to say again, a personal thank you for the work that you put out in the world. This aspect of pursuing our dreams, of sharing with the world who we really are, um, I think is an antidote to so much of the, the stuff that we see going on nowadays. And so thank you for doing the research, for having the courage to put this work out there. Uh, and congratulations on it being so damn successful. That tells us that there's a big hungry need for this. I'm going to restate a couple of things and then I'll ask a question about if there's anywhere else you'd like to direct our audience. But the book you got to get, folks, is The Love Prescription, Seven Days to More Intimacy, Connection, and Joy. Um, of course, there are a number of other books, a couple of which John and Julie have mentioned uh, in this show. So go back and listen to those. We'll put some of those in the show notes. Also, again, the Gottman Institute website, which is just Gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N. All this stuff, all this information is there. A lot of the you know the lists of questions. You can um, take some assessments, for example. And there's a specifically a place in there for professionals, which I found rewarding where you can go in there and, and this you know, not all this is about love there's a lot of just stuff about general relationships and if you're going to be in community and john said the lack of community is one of the key challenges to this era this era that we're in how can we rebuild that um all super super valuable so with my little summary there is there anywhere else you would you know focus our audience's attention where would you want to direct direct them to uh how can they participate uh in y'all's work and where would you steer them Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the only other thing I would refer uh, your audience to is uh, a separate little website that we created uh, that's called Gottman Connect. And Gottman Connect is the place, the software platform, where we have put all of our assessment methods, all of our exercises into an app. Uh, that you can access very, very easily. The app is called The Relationship Coach. Uh, and it's really cool. It has little videotapes of John and I doing things right, doing things wrong, and the wrong ones are really very well practiced. So they're very... <laughs> and we welcome you there and at the Gottman Institute. And um, we want to thank you again, Chase, for the opportunity to really share our work with you and your own vulnerability here was really appreciated. Yeah. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to talk with you. So thank you. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, being uh, in your once retired, at some point, you're going to bring it back the art and science of love. But until then, I've got a lot of other work to do on, on your materials. I want to say thanks again for being on the show. Uh, we're huge fans. Uh, your work is always welcome here. We look forward to having you back again when you keep putting out this good stuff. Uh, and for all the folks out there in the world, again, the love prescription, seven days of more intimacy, connection, and joy, all the other apps and resources there is this is life-changing material and thank you all so much for being who you are and for being on the show today it's been a real treat to be with you thank Thanks. you thank you chase all right to everybody out there in the world until next time uh from myself from julie john we bid you adieu